The images that are on your website or mobile app are likely the biggest contributors to carbon emissions being served from your page. But does that mean that you should get rid of all those images? Of course not, you should just be optimizing them. Which is why I built Image Carbon to help you test your page and see how much those images are contributing to your footprint. It shows you an estimate of how much carbon your images are actually producing. But we're gonna see how you can build your own carbon testing tool in a Next.js app, CO2.js to get our carbon estimates, Cloudinary to optimize and get our image metadata, and Zada to cache those results to avoid making expensive requests, all within Next.js serverless and Edge API routes. Hey team, I'm Colby Fayok. I make weekly web dev tutorials helping you to solve real problems with the tools of the web. And today we're gonna learn how to build an app that scrapes images and determines how much carbon that page is producing. So I'm gonna dig in using this starter that I created, which just includes some simple UI and basic form handling to get started. If you wanna follow along, you can find a link to the starter in the description. So inside of the application, I have this handle on submit function where anytime the form is submitted, we go through, we get that URL, we try to make sure that it's formatted properly. We set it into state. And then once that site URL updates, as long as it is actually set, we're going to have this ability to run some kind of code. And inside here, this is where we're going to start off where the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to scrape the images from the website. To do this, we're gonna use Scraping B, which is a service that allows us to scrape really any kind of data from a website. Rather than just giving us the HTML response, it's going to actually render the page, including JavaScript if we select the option to so that we can actually get the real page content. Once we're logged into Scraping B with our free account, we're gonna head over to the request builder, where here we get a bunch of starter templates in order to help us easily take advantage of the pre-configured settings, where if we start to look through, we have a lot of different options, we have a lot of different SDKs that we can use in order to do this, but to make things easier, we can simply select the option that we want if it fits our use case, where I wanna extract the images from a web page, and that's exactly what I wanna do, so I'm gonna go ahead and select that. It even describes what it's actually doing, it's using extract rules to define what to grab from the page and as we go down we can see how that's going to be set up we can see our extract rules set up including grabbing all the images from the page it's even going to grab the alt um, but then we can even test this out if i enter in my website such as space jelly store and i click try it out i'm going to be able to scroll down and i'm going to be able to see all that content including all the images both the source and the alt for each of them that i was able to find as we can see we have javascript rendering checked where my application is probably going to load with just that first initial HTML response because it's being pre-rendered. But if I didn't have it and I needed that application and client logic, it's going to be able to use that and use the JavaScript rendering to be able to capture that. But now let's actually implement this into our application where we're going to create an API that makes this scraping request and pulls it back into our application. Before we actually dig in with this SDK, we're going to use Next.js Edge API routes for this. And why use the Edge API routes? Well, there's a lot of good reasons as to why to use the Edge runtime. It's probably going to be faster. The timeout for those requests are going to be much greater than of the serverless equivalents, which makes it really handy for using scraping since if it's a huge site with a lot of different HTML content, it might take a little bit extra time in order to do that. So inside of our project, let's create a new file underneath the pages API and let's call it scrape.js where I'm going to export a default async function called handler where inside of the arguments, I'm going to first define my request, but then I got to tell Next.js that this is an edge function. So I'm going to export a constant of config and I'm going to add my runtime as edge. Now the edge functions are going to look a little bit different than the typical serverless functions that you might be used to. We're going to ultimately return a new response. And inside that the first argument is going to be the content for now, just to test that this is working. Let's do JSON stringify. I'm going to pass in an empty object, but then I got to configure what I want the response to look like, including a status of 200. I'm going to set up my headers where I want to make sure I paste in a content type of application JSON. And then we can test that this is working by going to the endpoint in the browser and we see that empty object. Now, one thing that's tricky about edge functions that we're going to have to work around is that it doesn't have access to all the typical node APIs that the original serverless functions have. That's because it uses a different runtime and it doesn't use node as that runtime. So while it has access to a lot of handy things that we'll need, that means some SDKs won't work if it uses an API that's not supported. And that's the case with scraping B. So that means we're not going to be able to use the Node.js SDK. We're going to actually hit the API manually. Well, we're going to do that with the fetch API. We can click this Node.js request, which just makes it a little bit easier to break down all the information that we're going to need to pass in, including this endpoint. We're inside of my function. I'm going to create a new constant called results and set that to await use the fetch API to actually hit that endpoint where the way that we're able to pass in all the information is we're going to pass it in as query parameters. So I'm going to actually make this a template literal tag. And before I forget, I'm going to chain on a then with my R 
JSON so that I can transform it into a JSON response. But let's start creating the parameters that we're going to set in. So I'm going to create a new constant of params, where if we look inside of scraping B, we have all these different options. So I'm going to just copy this and paste it in as my params. And we want to make sure that we're not storing this API key right inside of the code. So I'm going to grab this out, set it up as an environment variable and pull it in dynamically as my API key. But one thing also to notice here is these extract rules where this is going to be a JSON string, where we have all the rules that we have defined. We don't necessarily need to update this right now, but if we ever wanted to make this dynamic, we would want to do something along the lines of json.stringify if I pass that right, where we can pass in that object with all the different rules that we have. But before we start making this dynamic, let's finish testing this out, where next I need to transform the params into a param string. I'm going to create a new constant of params string and set that equal to object.keys for my params so that I can get each and every one of these, where I'm going to map through those. And then for each of those keys, I'm going to create a new dynamic value where I'll pass in that key as my key and then set that equal to the actual value, which is going to be params key. I should probably also wrap this in encode URI component just to make sure that we're passing in these values confidently. And then finally, I'm going to run join on this with an and symbol, where now I can take this param string, I'm gonna pass it in at the end of my actual endpoint. And now let's console log out these results. Once this comes back, we can see that I do get my data. It has an images property that has an array of all those images. So I'm gonna go ahead and destructure images from those results. And I'm gonna pass that back as one of the properties in my response. Now, in order to actually use this, we want this URL value to be dynamic. Well, we could probably turn this into a post request. We can just keep this as a get request and use a query parameter to grab that URL. So I'm gonna create a new constant of URL. I'm gonna set that equal to request dot next URL. We're on the search params property. I'm gonna get a key of URL, which we're gonna pass in dynamically from our application, where then I can pass that URL directly to my params. Now back inside of my application, I wanna start actually scraping the site. Now I wanna use async await syntax, and you can't use that at a top level use effect. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a self invoking uh, async function called run. It doesn't really matter what you call it, but then I'm going to actually invoke it. And inside I'm gonna say, I wanna create a constant of results and set that equal to await fetch, where I'm going to make a fetch request to that API scrape, where I'm going to pass in my URL, and I'm going to do that dynamically with the site URL that we're currently setting in state within the application. I'm going to then also chain on my then r.json to turn that into a JSON response, and let's console log out those results again, just to test that this is running as expected. So inside of my application, if I now pass in that URL and hit test, I'm gonna get that results and we can see that I now have my images right inside of my application. And that means we've already successfully scraped all those images from the site, as simple as that. But there's a lot more information that we wanna actually collect in order to add value to this page. That includes grabbing the size of the images for each and every one of those, which we probably just do with the fetch request that we're already doing, that we already have, but there's a lot of other information that we want to get, such as we want to get the format reliably, we want to get the width and the height reliably, and we also want to use the images on our own hosting rather than just assuming that the person that uses a site is always going to keep that up for the lifetime that we want to show these results. So we're going to use Cloudinary in order to upload, store our images, and also optimize those images. Inside of a serverless function, we're going to use the Node SDK, which will allow us to easily upload them to our account. We'll also use Next Cloudinary, which allows us to easily add those images onto our page, but allow us to also easily construct a new URL for the optimized version. So back inside of my project, I'm going to create a new API and I'm going to actually duplicate the hello one where I'm going to say upload, it's called upload.js. And inside here, the only thing I want to make different is I want to make it an async function where then we're just going to use the typical status of 200, where here we're going to return our image results. Inside of your terminal, we can install Cloudinary with npm install Cloudinary. And inside of our function, we're going to import v2 as cloudinary from cloudinary now with cloudinary we're going to want to run the config method we're inside we're going to define our cloud name our api key and our api secret where i've gone ahead and added an environment variable for each of these like we did with the scraping b1 but then inside of our handler we're going to grab the images that we're going to post to this request so i'm going to say constant images is equal to json parse request body where I want to loop through each and every one of these images and actually upload it to my Cloudinary account. So I'm going to start off and create a constant of upload, setting that equal to an empty array, where then I'm going to say for const image of images, I'm going to 
now process each of those uploads, where I'm going to create a constant of results is equal to await cloudinary.uploader.upload, where I'm going to pass in that image.source. And then I want to set some additional options on my upload, where specifically I'm going to create all these images in a new folder, just so I can have it a little bit organized, where I'm going to say image perf tester. Now with those results, I can push to my upload where I want to make that uploads. Where I'm going to push the results. And then inside of my return statement, I'm just going to pass back a data of my uploads. So now that we have our new endpoint, let's actually test this out and make sure that it works. So inside of the original scrape results, we're going to get our images. I'm going to redefine that as website images so we don't have conflicts with other things named images. And then I'm going to create a new constant. Let's call this uploads this time, where I'm going to set that equal to await fetch, where this time we're going to hit that API of upload, where inside we want to first set the method to post, and then we're going to create a new body, where inside we're going to JSON dot stringify, where we're going to pass through our website images as the images key. Now, of course, like usual, we want to add that then statement where we're going to turn that into JSON so we can see the results, but then let's console log out those uploads. I'm going to try out a different page this time. Let's just paste in one of my blog posts where we can see our different requests happening, where now I can actually see all that upload data logged out, where I can see all the new information about each and every one of those images, including that format the size of the image, and I now have my uploaded URL. So now we have a lot of the information for the first half of the story of what our current images look like, where we have the size, we have the uh, the dimensions, we have the format, we have that information to help us show what the current state is. But now we can actually take this data and start to transform it to look like something we can more easily use on the page, but then we can start adding in our calculations on top in order to make that easier to use. So what I'm going to do is map through all these uploads and grab all those data points. to start off, I'm going to destructure my data as those uploads. And then I'm going to say constant images is equal to where I'm going to create a new await of promise.all because what I'm going to do is create a map of asynchronous functions because I want to make a request in there. We'll talk about that later, but I'm going to run that uploads where I'm going to map through and create that async function where for each image, I'm going to run this new function where I'm going to start off by returning a new object where I want to start to collect all that information about these images, including my width, my height, I want to add my information about the original image, which is going to be an object. I want to add information about my uploaded image, but then I'm going to ultimately add information about my optimized image. A lot of this information will actually come from the image results that we already have, including the width, and the height. I'm going to go ahead and grab the secure URL and public ID from my upload. I'm going to add the size and the format that will also come from that upload. But then I want to also store that original URL just in case I want to use it for something. So because we were just passing in all those images directly to the uploads, they should all have the same key or rather array position. So we can just grab that same index. So I'm going to make this where I can also grab the index of the current image that I'm mapping through. And I'm just going to grab from the original website images. I'm going to make that URL as website images. I or I'm going to grab that source. So before we start filling in the other stuff, let's actually console log this out just to make sure that we're currently working right. And while it looks like the site only just has one image that I'm currently tested, it looks like everything's working pretty great, except for the public ID, which it looks like I just used camel case instead of the actual key value. But now let's actually start collecting the optimized information. Where I mentioned we're going to use Next Cloudinary, and beyond the basic usage of just showing our Cloudinary images on our page, which we'll get to once we have the final results, one of the helpers that we have available inside of Next Cloudinary is this get CLD image URL that just allows us to easily construct a URL and easily add those optimizations. So inside of my project, I'm going to install Next Cloudinary with npm install Next Cloudinary. And if you noticed earlier inside of my Cloudinary config, I actually made my Cloudinary cloud name Next public Cloudinary cloud name. And that's because I want to also use that value inside of the application where the other values are going to be secret. So I have this next public Cloudinary cloud name where when set is automatically going to configure our account for using next Cloudinary. So that means I can just import that get CLD image URL from next Cloudinary. But then inside of my map statement, I'm going to create a new optimized URL where I'm going to use that get CLD image URL function. And all I need to do is paste in the public ID or I could technically paste in the secure URL 
it doesn't really matter because it'll try to parse the URL. So I'm going to set a source of that public ID. And then what we're going to do is set a format of ABIF. And technically we could use auto, which depending on the browser will give the best or most efficient format for that browser or device. But we want to force using ABIF as we just want to make sure that we have consistent results between the different browsers when we're trying to compare the optimized and the original version. But now we can start off by filling in our optimized object here. We can set the URL as optimized. We can also set the format of AVIF, but then we want to also grab the uh, size of that image. And to do that, we can just make a simple fetch request and grab the blob size. So I'm going to create a new constant called optimized size. And let's say await fetch. I'm going to pass in that optimized URL and I'm going to add a then statement where I'm going to turn the response. But this time I'm going to turn that response to a blob. We're on that blob. I'm going to wrap this in parentheses. I'm going to attribute or grab the attribute of size from that blob. But then I can take that constant and I'm going to go ahead and pass that in as the size for my optimized version. Now, if you remember earlier, this is why we set up a promise all statement with async functions getting mapped through because we were going to make that fetch request in here. But now let's try this again. And like magic, it returns all of our results. And we even have the optimized size and the URL and everything we need, except we're missing one more thing where now we want to grab the carbon produced from all those images. We're using CO2JS. We have a couple different options for how we can do this, but we're going to use per visit, which takes into consideration that somebody might return to a site multiple times. And that also includes caching, where it's not going to be the same equivalent if the browser already has that image downloaded. Now, trying to actually calculate these carbon emissions is a very challenging topic. So if you want to learn more about how this is working, head over to sustainablewebdesign.org or the CO2JS website from the Green Web Foundation. You can find all these links inside of the description. But heading back to our terminal, let's npm install that package, where I'm just going to paste that in, where we're going to import CO2 from that package. But then in order to use it, we need to create a new instance of CO2. So I'm going to paste that new instance at the top of my page, where then where we're collecting data, we're going to add a new property of CO2 to both original and optimized, where I'm going to say swd.pervisit, where we're going to just go ahead and pass through that size in bytes to that function. And I'll do the same thing for optimized, but this time, of course, passed in optimized size. But now this time, when I look through my results, I can now see that both in the original and optimized versions, I now have this amount of CO2 that was produced for that image. Now, this looks like a really, really low number, right? But consider like if we go to imagecarbon.com where we can see these results, that if we look at that estimated CO2, where for the entire page, it's 0.1 grams. If we actually look at where we're calculating the requests, say that site or that gets 10,000 requests every single month, and then for a year, that would be about 120,000. That's gonna be like 6.3 kilograms of carbon. And while we're not actually gonna do all those calculations of that value inside of this demo, the actual Image Carbon website is completely open Open source over on my GitHub. But now let's actually get this information on the page. We're inside of the starter. We already have this site images state instance. So we're going to simply set our images into that state. So I'm going to copy and run that set site images where I'm going to pass in images. But inside of the page, I also have some pre-built UI where I have these list items where we're going to map through all of our data and create a new image row for each and every one. So I'm going to say site images, and I'm going to add some optional chaining on here just to make sure that it's working, where we're going to say map. And for each image, I'm going to go ahead and cut out that list item. And we're going to return that list item where I'm not going to actually go through showing, writing out each and every one of these values. Where once we have this all filled out, the only thing we might want to consider is how we're actually presenting some of this information. Where size, for instance, this is going to be in bytes, which might not actually make a lot of sense if somebody's just trying to look at that really large value of bytes. So let's also change this into kilobytes, where we can just divide that by 1,000. And then at the end, we can pass in that KB to designate that it is actually kilobytes. And while we could probably do the same thing with CO2, I'll leave that to you. But for now, we can at least say that that's going to be in grams. But now when we run this test again, we can see that we get all of our images displayed on the page. And we also get all that information where we can now start to compare the original versus the optimized version. Now, we're not going to really do too much more with the UI itself. But one thing we want to do consider is we don't want to be loading these images as the original values, as these can still be really big images. So this is where NextCloudinary is going to come in 
plugin where we're just going to pass these images into next cloudary and let it handle automatically optimizing them and we can even even crop them down if we prefer so that it fits the ui to how we want it to so i'm going to also import cld image from that next cloudary package and because i already have my width my height my source and even an alt define on these images which are the required parameters all i need to do is replace that tag where once we have the results pop in again we can see that we now are loading all those images as avif which is going to give us the most efficient format for those specific images now technically we can probably stop there as we have all the images and information we need but something to consider is all these requests that we're making are expensive requests where between the scraping and the uploading it takes a lot of time and potentially money if you go past the free tier or to help stay under it it's going to take those resources in order to actually make those requests every single time so instead what we can do is cache those results and to do that we're going to use zada which is a serverless database which has a lot of pretty amazing features that come out of the box with its apis and sdks but we're really going to focus in this tutorial on just getting the data in there and then fetching it back out so once you've set up your zada account and you're logged in we're going to create a new database where inside that database we want to create two tables where the first table we're going to create a name of sites where inside we're going to want to have two columns which is going to have the site url we're going to create that column we're also going to have the date collected which we can use in the future as a method for determining when that data set should actually expire we're then going to create another table where we're going to call this one images we're inside we're basically going to reflect the image data that we have where to start let's create an integer of width we're going to also create an integer of height, but then we're going to also create a column for each of our different fields of optimized. We're going to create our original, and then we also have the last one of upload. Now, the way that we're going to handle that is we're going to pass in the width and height as is, but we're going to pass in the optimized original and upload as a JSON stringified value. Now, one last column that's probably the most important column here is we want to add a new string for site url so that we can actually correlate this to the actual site but at this point this is going to give us all the columns and the tables that we need to actually interface so now we need to just get that data inside the nice thing is they give us this code snippet option that makes it really easy to get set up in our account so we can first get started by installing the cli which you can go ahead and paste inside your terminal and once that's done we can also copy in our initialization which i'm going to paste in as well which will actually give us some steps to walk through in order to set up our project so we can choose if we want typescript for instance where i'm going to say generate typescript code we can then choose where we want that to go i'm going to say source lib zada.ts where you could choose the default if you want but then it's going to install all the zada dependencies that we need and it's even going to set up the environment variable for your api key and it might ask you to log in but otherwise if you need to log in you can run zada auth login if we look inside of lib zada.ts we can see all that code that has generated and we don't necessarily need to do anything with this unless we're changing something or if we want to. Honestly, you can run the init, init command again if you change anything inside the UI. But now we have this client that we can import and actually make our requests. Now to start, I wanna actually take this data and add it to Zada. So to do this, we're gonna use a serverless function again. So I'm gonna call this add site.js. I'm gonna paste in the basic code that we've used before. And at the top, I'm going to import get Zada client from at lib zada then with that function i'm going to say constant zada is equal to get zada client now there's going to be two steps for this where we're going to first create the site but then we're going to add the images for that site now we're going to get all the information from the request body similar to what we've been doing before so i'm going to say constant site url images and date collected is equal to json parse our request body and first things first i'm going to create that site record so i'm going to say constant site record is equal to i'm going to run await zada.db.sites.create where inside i'm going to pass in my site url and i'm going to pass in my date collected now just as a reminder back inside zada if you want you can check out all these different ways where you can even see how to insert one of those records but once that's finished we now want to also add all the images to the images table where we're going to do something really similar here so first i'm going to just duplicate this but we're going to send this into the images table and we're going to now have our images records since we're going to have multiple but the one thing to consider is we're going to pass in those images as an array not just that single object instance now before we actually run this one thing we need to do is a few of those columns are going to be stringifying json so we need to map through our images and actually stringify those objects before we send them in so i'm going to create a new constant of images to cache and let's set that equal to images.map 
And for each of those images, I'm going to actually just first return all the image data itself, but then I'm going to override the optimized upload and original, where I'm going to pass in a JSON stringified version of that property. And additionally, I want to make sure I pass through that site URL. So again, we have a way to correlate that, but then I'm going to make sure I pass through images to cache into that create instance where we don't necessarily need to pass back the records into the response. We're not going to do anything with them inside the UI. I'm just going to say status of okay. And now just like any of the other APIs, we need to now hit it from the browser where I'm going to await fetch. I'm going to hit that API add site, where as my options, I'm going to pass in my method of post. I'm going to pass in a body that we're going to json.stringify. I'm going to pass in my images. I'm going to pass in my site URL, but then I'm going to pass in a date collected where that's going to be a new date instance. Then I'm going to say date.now just to get the current date. I'm going to say to ISO string. So now when we test this out again, it looks like I get a 500 error. And just be honest, it looks like it's because of a typo here where this time we can see that that add site was successfully finished. And if we look in Zada, I already have two site records, but that's because I accidentally had a typo for that one. So I'll just go ahead and delete one of those. But then if we look at our images, we have all this image data that we can now store and use for our site. Now we're not going to handle deduplication in this tutorial, but what you can do is check if this site URL exists. If it does, you would only update it instead of creating it. And then you can just sweep clean and delete all the images that are referenced for that particular site, and then just store all the new ones just to make sure you're getting fresh versions. But we have one final step and we want to actually now get that cache rather than creating those new requests. Now to make things easier, I'm just going to duplicate this current ad site and let's just call this get site.js where because we're getting the data, let's actually make this a get request. So I'm going to destructure URL from the request.query, which is going to be a query parameter. And then we're going to look up all that information based off of that URL. So I'm going to say constant site is equal to await zada.db.sites, where instead of getting all those values, I'm going to first run a filter where I'm going to say, I want my site URL to be that URL. And then I just want to get the first value just in case I do happen to have two instances of that site URL in there. I also want to get all the images. So I'm going to say constant of images, and then I'm going to say for all the images, I'm going to filter for that same site URL, but this time I'm just going to get all. Now we can get rid of that site record and we can get rid of the images to cache. We can get rid of the image records, but we do have one more thing we got to do. And with those images, if we again, remember we were JSON stringifying those objects and passing those through. So now we need to parse them so we can reuse those in the application. So I'm going to actually turn this into a let where I'm going to say images is equal to images.map. And for each image, I'm going to return my image again, but then just going to skip ahead a little bit for each of the optimized upload and original, I'm going to actually just run JSON parse this time. And then finally, instead of the status of okay, let's pass back our site and our images. So now again, we want to pull these into our application if they exist. So we're going to do that inside the run statement, but we're going to do that at the very beginning because we don't want to go through all those requests if we already have those in place. So I'm going to create a constant of cache and I'm going to set that equal to await fetch where I'm going to try to hit that API, which is going to be a dynamic value of API get sites where I'm going to pass in my URL query parameter and set that equal to site URL. As usual, I'm going to chain and then and turn that into JSON. But now I want to check if that cache exists. So I'm going to say if cache site and cache images, I'm going to go ahead and just set my site images as those cache images. And then I'm going to return so that I don't continue on where let's test this one more time where when I click test, we can see that that loaded in very quickly. I didn't cut that scene. We can look at that get request and we can look at the preview where we see all that site and that image data come right in through that request. So that worked perfectly, but let's just try it again on another URL just to make sure things are working. Where just to prove that this works, let's just try another URL where we can see that it's running get site, but it's going to continue to scrape and upload where once it's finished, we're going to see all those images. And now if we try it again, we can see how fast that loaded in and immediately get all those image results again. Now we're going to stop there but make sure to check out imagecarbon.com where you can test your site to see how much carbon is there, but you can also see what other kind of features you can add using the stuff that we learned today, including this counter where you can check out how many requests or expand on the number of quests so you can see the equivalent of carbon that's actually being created.
While there's certainly a lot more to the story of saving the planet than loading images in an optimized version, it's our way of being able to help make sure that our footprint is as low as it can be. What are you doing this Earth Day to try to increase awareness or decrease your footprint? Let me know in the comments. Want to take this project to another level? Build a custom search API with Zada and actually use all that data we collected for some interesting insights. If you like this video, make sure you hit thumbs up, subscribe, and click that little notification bell for future web dev content. Thanks for watching.